have any control over those things. Okay? And it may often be that I won't measure them. You'll always measure the flow, because flow is like reasonably cheap to measure and it's very reliable. Right? The problem with composition measurements is that they're just not reliable. And they're expensive. So what do you gotta do to get a composition measurement? You gotta plan. You gotta you gotta measure the composition. You have to take a sample. You have to take a sample out of the process too. Unless you do like FDIR or something. But typically if you do GC, you gotta sample it. So you gotta have a sampling system. It takes the sample to where the GC is. You can't have a GC sitting next to a plant, right? Out in the rain or whatever. So it's in a little house with other GCs that pipe the sample all the way to this place. Okay. That takes a lot of time, right? And what happens is the sampling system doesn't work, it gets clogged, the GC quits working. Um, lots of things can go wrong. Okay, so you only do composition measurements if you have to. And if you went to someone that operated the plant, like the person that... So when you work in a plant, there's going to be several groups. One group is the operations people whose job is to make money. And then there's your group. <laughs> and your group is designed to make sure the plant operates well. The people that make money always reign supreme, right? So if you want to, let's say you'd say, wow, it'd be really nice if I knew the composition of the fee, the guy will say, how much money is it going to make? And you're like, I don't know. You know so that's, that, you know, you can't have that, okay? So all this instrumentation costs money. If you ever want to do something, you have to prove it makes money. That's the only way you get anything done, okay? All right. So um, what I'm going to do now, and I'm going to, I'll have to see if maybe I'll hook up my, play a little video here. It's not a pleasant video, actually. As you can tell by the name of it, right? Explosion. All right, that's not good. I don't even know where my speakers are on this thing. Anybody? Yes. Anyway, I'll get started, and then I'll put the mic and I'll crank up the volume. So the point of this video is to um, give you some idea of what happens when control systems fail. Liquid from the bottom of the tower to 
the storage tanks. This should have improved conditions inside the flooded tower. But the liquid at the bottom of the tower was very hot, and as it exited through the heat exchanger, it suddenly raised the temperature of the feed going into the tower by over 150 degrees. By 1.05 p.m., the liquid entering the tower was beginning to boil and expand, causing the level inside the tower to increase further. At 1.10 p.m., the tower began overflowing liquid into the piping off the top of the tower. Liquid built up in this vertical piping and exerted great pressure on the emergency relief valves 150 feet below. At 1.14 p.m., the three emergency valves opened and liquid began flooding the blowdown drum at the other end of the isomerization unit. Some liquid overflowed from the blowdown drum into a process sewer. But the high level alarm on the blowdown drum didn't go off. The drum filled completely and bystanders saw a geyser-like eruption from the top of the blowdown stack. The eruption lasted about one minute. Liquid fell to the ground, creating a large flammable vapor cloud. This model predicts how far the vapor cloud expanded across the area just one minute after the release began from the stack. At 1.20 p.m., the cloud ignited, causing a series of explosions. The CSB believes the vapor cloud was most likely ignited by a diesel pickup truck parked about 25 feet from the blowdown. The next computer simulation shows how the blast pressure wave is predicted to have moved after the cloud was ignited. The blast pressure wave is accelerating as it moves through the ISOM unit, causing heavy destruction and igniting more fires. This is the area where two trailers were destroyed, fatally injuring 15 contract workers. This videotape shot by Houston station KHOU, shows the ISOM unit as fires continue to burn after the explosion. You can see the blowdown stack still emitting flames as hydrocarbons are released. Several vehicles were set on fire and burned in the aftermath. Over 50 large chemical storage tanks were damaged. Firefighters struggled to rescue the injured and locate the missing. Chemical Safety Board's investigation to determine the root causes of the tragedy began the following day. Okay, well that's not a pleasant video, but um, hopefully you get the idea that, um, I guess first of all, you guys, well, you guys actually get jobs. <laughs> um, the stakes are a lot higher than mine. It's kind of a combination of, um, like you heard a lot of instrument failure, right? That thing wasn't working. That valve didn't work. That indicator was saying it was dropping in those 130 feet. And then you also see the operators. The operators are making mistakes, right? That's not what said. They didn't, they didn't open the flow out of the column like they're supposed to. So, um, so this is the ultimate case of a failed control system, right? I mean, this is, this is like... Operations people won't like this because you're making bad product if the product quality varies like that. But um, obviously this is an extreme case, right? And, and these these kind of things get massive publicity, as you probably know. If you've ever lived in a place where they make chemicals, it's just here because it's too expensive. Um, the news crews are outside the plant all the time, just waiting, just waiting for something to go wrong. And, and so if there's a release, they're immediately contacting the people at the plant. Like, why was there a why was there a release? Why did you vent gas out of unit number three or whatever? And, and hopefully you appreciate that the people's perception of chemical engineering is not that great. Um, people, like if you, if you were, um, let's try to think of a noble field, like a doctor, right? Well, it's pressing, well, right? My wife's a doctor, so it seems pretty noble. Um, you know, but most people's idea of a chemical engineer is you're making nasty chemicals and you're just, you're just trying to make a lot of money. Both of which are true. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know that this the, the, the stakes are really high, and um, so as you you know at this point you guys have been pretty um, protected from all this, and you know. But once you start to get a job, 
but you will. And you're going to be in an environment like this, and God, God forbid this ever happens, anything like this. Okay? Alright, so um, this is kind of, if you look at a typical plant, this is what we're talking about in terms of all the layers of control that are meant to try to avoid the kind of thing happening that we just saw. So first of all, you have the process. Then you have measurement and actuation. This means like measuring flow temperature, pressure, and, and typically moving valves around. Okay, this is on a time scale of less than a second, let's say, or about a second. Then you have, which we'll talk about a lecture, that's all the interlocks and safety things that are put in place to make sure that what you just saw does not happen. Okay? There's a control system, but there's something overriding the control system at this level that just shuts everything down. Okay? So the first thing you, you should do with that unit they have is, is get everything out of that column. Right? Don't build a column. Empty the column. That would be a, and this is done at this level, right? If, if some if some uh, problem is observed and you don't try to do this at the control level, you do this at, at another level this, that we'll talk about. Okay. The main focus of what we're going to talk about, whoops, I'm sure what happened there, is this so-called regulatory control level. This means controlling level, pressure, temperature, uh, flows. Okay. These are the most common uh, measurements. These are the most common controllers. That will be our main focus. Near the end of the course, we'll talk more about this idea of multivariable control. Like, how do you control the column that has more than, you know, has lots of inputs and outputs that we would like to control. Um, and then I'll have one lecture, well, okay. I'll have a couple lectures at the beginning on, uh, well, a lecture on um, instrumentation, let's say, a lecture on the safety stuff, and then at the very end, something called real-time optimization. Okay. So the idea here is this is, um, Information is flowing down for the most part, but also up. Many of these things I think you guys have never even heard of, is my guess. You know what planning and scheduling is? Okay. So let's say you make um, you have ethylene, you make ethylene, you, right? And you have you know 16 ethylene plants around the world, probably not that many, seven. Then the idea is how do you plan the manufacturing of each of these plants so you can give the get the ethylene to the customer you want at minimum price? You understand? So that's called planning. There's also scheduling like a batch processes. If you're in a pharmaceutical environment and you're making more than one product, you might make a certain product in a batch manufacturing process for two weeks called campaign, then you might switch to another one. So that's all the scheduling that goes into this. And this is kind of high level. This is almost business level. In case we didn't really talk about that. Real-time optimization, this is how a refinery works. So if roughly every week, or maybe even more often, operating a refinery, you, you run a huge optimization problem that you determine how much of each product you should make to make as much money as you can. Okay. You know, they don't make more um, heating oil in the winter because they like you. They make more because they can sell it for a high price. Okay. And so this is how you're going to operate the plant to maximize cost per um, revenue, let's say. And this provides information to the control system. Basically, it gives you the set points of where you should operate the plant. Okay. So we're going to really focus on these levels, but the main focus is going to be right here in the middle. Okay? And you could argue that the idea of control is roughly something like this. Okay? So let's, for simplicity, let's say this is the production rate versus time. Okay? So if you look at this picture, you see production rate is kind of relatively low and highly variable. Right? So you'd like something more like this. Right? If you raise the average value of the production rate, and also reduce the variability. Okay? So this is what you want to do with control. For example, make as much of the product as you can and reduce the variability as much as possible. Customers don't like variability. Yeah. All right, so this is, gives you an overview of the whole kind of process of putting a control system together. Um, it starts with formulating what you want to do with control. So there's two kinds of control projects. One is, uh, well, three really. One is where you have a brand new plant. It's called a grassroots project. So you're building a, a plant in Singapore or China or something like this. That's where most of the plants go, these days. Okay? They don't go in Wisconsin. So at that point, you have no control system at all, so you're starting completely from scratch. Okay? Another one is that you have a big control improvement project. That means you have a plant that's operating, but you've decided you've got to do a big project to make it much better. Okay? The other thing is just day-to-day -day improvement tasks. You know, make it work a little bit better, this fails, improve it, so on and so forth. Okay? But at some point, you have to formulate what you're trying to do and how you're going to do it. In the cases we're going to talk about, this is not always true, and we'll talk about this, but for the most part, um, this is going to involve doing some modeling. Okay? So the idea of developing a model is it helps you understand the process you're trying to control, and ultimately, you can actually just design a controller based on the mathematical model you have. By model, I mean set of differential equations. Okay. And then, um, once you have this model, you can use the model plus the things we're going to talk about in the course that actually design the controller. So the things you see
testing of control systems, at least on the computer. So the strategy is develop a model, understand the model, develop <coughs> the control system based on the model, then simulate how it works. Once it's, you're comfortable how it works in the model, then you can install it in the client. I'll talk about these things, Jeff, but I won't, I won't focus on them because it's fine. This is what you'll learn if you do this kind of work in industry. Okay, so um, you'll hear this term a lot, controller design. So this is one of the few courses in the curriculum that's very design focused. So, um, there's something called ABET, they, they credit engineering programs, and they require that programs have a certain amount of design content. Design is different than analysis. So when you guys do um, kinetics, for example, someone gives you a problem, and then they say, figure out the residence time, or something like this, that does, that you give you this conversion. There's, there's very little design. Okay? The design problem would be, here's my feed, here's the product I want, build a reactor for me. Plug, flow, batch, CSTR, I don't care. That's design, okay? And you guys don't get much design exposure until like the last year. Obviously process design is a lot about design. Um, now, what makes process design a lot different than this course is, first of all, you'll find design is, um, the idea of design is how do you, I don't really have a picture of a whole plant, but how do you put a whole plant together? Like, what should the reactors be? What should the columns be? So on and so forth. But it's also completely based on steady state considerations. So typically, one does process design, and then that's followed up by doing the control. Ideally, they're done together, but usually they're not done together. Okay. All right, so in terms of controller design, what I mean here is you're trying to design mathematically what the controller should be for a particular problem. There's two approaches. The traditional approach is um, the back of the envelope calculation kind of thing. Um, you do this all based on knowledge. You don't have a model, and you remember that KC thing, which was the um, controller gain. You adjust that until you get reasonable performance. Okay. How do you do this? You can't teach it, really, right? You do this by experience. So when you guys were in lab, and if you had a control experiment, I've had this. Someone says, I can't control the pH controller. And I walk down there. Ten minutes later, I walk away, and it's too late because I've done this a lot. But this is not a this is not a basis to do. I mean, teach, right? What the whole course consisted of? Just play around with the KC until it looks good. That's real. That's real fundamental. Okay. So we don't pursue this approach. I'll talk about it. It is used. It is based on having a lot of experience. It works. The process is simple and easy to control. It's usually done with something called PID control, which we'll talk about. Um, we're going to. Primarily focus on something called model-based approach. So you build the dynamic model, the process you want to control, and then you use this model to design the controller in a variety of different ways. This is advantageous for complex processes, also kind of algorithmic, right? So I can teach you how to do it, and you can replicate it, which you can't do for the first approach. Okay. And this is what we call model-based control. Okay, so here, here. So with 361, I read through all the comments carefully, and here's what I'm going to do differently, and I'm, hope, I'm hoping you'll like these things. The first one is the thing I'm not going to do differently. Say it's sorry. Someone said, "Your quick using PowerPoint." That's like telling me to quit speaking English. I'm not really capable of that. But I'll, I'm trying to do everything else that you want. Okay. So there was people disagree. You know, when you get these comments, people disagree. Some people will say it's, it's a nightmare not having the slides, and then someone will say it's great not having the slides because it really makes me focus. So, uh, but my majority opinion was post the slides. We'll post them all, and I guess we're going to post. You might notice that there's video being taken. I have this mic on. So, so we're going to post lectures. This is really not meant to, number one, um, encourage you not to come to class. But you, you, I don't know if you've ever heard this term, flipping a course. It means that someone posts all the lecture stuff outside of class, and then the class is primarily used for problem solving. Okay? You, I don't know. You don't have anyone teaching like this currently in our in our department. So what, the, what I would do, I'm not promising this. I'm just saying this is the concept. If you have the videos, this is possible, but not guaranteed. Right? You it won't affect you guys anyway because you don't have to do it next time. You post all the videos of the lectures. You guys watch them on YouTube or whatever at your own leisure. And then when we come into class, just solve problems and answer questions. See, so that's called flipping the course. So if I have videos, that's possible. But at minimum, the videos will be posted. Um, ECS, you know those guys, right? Engineering computers. They, they assured me there's enough space to post all these videos, which will be, I think are going to get kind of large. All right, but it will post all the slides, okay? So you don't have to spend all your time copying them, although I don't know exactly when we'll get them up there because I'm waiting for my TA. Use 
recitation section, yeah. Some people, I'm sure, like not having a recitation section a lot, but I'll use it every single time with a few exceptions. One exception is this Friday, we won't have it. I'm going to use the, the recitation section primarily for MATLAB stuff. Okay? All right. Um, incorporate more MATLAB, yes, I will, especially in the recitation sections. Eliminate quizzes, yeah. Some people got mad things. If you said you would never give us a quiz, then you gave us a quiz. And I was like, okay. Textbook. Okay. The textbook is required, meaning I'll assume you have it. It'll have lots of 